Okay, so good morning and welcome everybody to the second week of the, the quantum, the quantum theory in a nutshell course. And we are starting lecture six uh, uh, today. And before I really jump into the topic of this lecture, I would like to make a brief uh, recap about uh, what we discussed uh, last week. Because, um, well, we discussed a lot of uh, uh, experiments that uh, essentially were telling us that classical theory was not uh, in good agreement with, with those experiments. And this uh, uh, demanded that uh, we needed something else. And the very first example of uh, failure of the description of the classical description was uh, the black body radiation um, and but the problem was uh, that uh, when trying to describe the radiation emitted by a black body we assumed that light uh, uh, was a wave as uh, described by Maxwell and it turns out that if you insist on this description of light as a wave that has uh, uh, the, the, that has the feature of transferring energy to a body, a heated body, and also being emitted by this heated body, um, if you insist on the description of light as a wave, then you get in trouble in order to describe the intensity of the emitted radiation against uh, the frequency of the emitted radiation. And then we discussed what, what is known as the ultraviolet catastrophe and how Planck uh, uh, dealt with this problem by postulating that actually energy was exchanged in, in packages of energy and not in a discrete uh, uh, amount of, of packages of energy and not in a continuum way. Um, and then Einstein uh, picked up on this idea to describe uh, the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect, uh, in principle, the very existence of it does not contradict um, uh, the classical theory but of course, the, the specific properties of how light uh, uh, um, removes electrons from a metal plate and all the details, all the characteristics about this phenomenon. Uh, this was in contradiction with the classical theory. And uh, what Einstein did was to say, well, um, Let's forget about this idea that light is a wave and treat light as a beam of particle, uh, uh, well, of the particles of light, which were then called as photons. And uh, then uh, we discussed uh, what happens when you direct a light ray towards a target made of some material and in particular, uh, if you have um, um, if you have uh, a, a target that you can describe as a single electron, then we saw that the scattering of light is such that the scattered light ray will have a different um, uh, wavelength with respect to the with the ingoing light ray, and this this new wavelength will depend on the direction that you look, and this is the so-called uh, Compton shift, and this is what we call the Compton effect, and we learn how to describe the Compton effect by using um, um, by using uh, the description of light as a beam of particles. So. We described uh, how to how to obtain the mathematical expression for the Compton shift 
by considering that uh, a collision between a photon and an electron. Uh, so Mahmoud is asking, uh, did the classical theory manage to explain anything in photoelectric effect? So um, the fact that you send light directed to a metal plate and that this metal plate will um, um, eject electrons, this is not in contradiction with the classical theory. So if you think about light or radiation as being an electromagnetic wave, then when it arrives at the plate, this thing has a, is made of an electric field and the electric field will make the electrons, you know, um, to shape more and more in the plate. And at some point the energy will be big enough so that the electron can jump outside the metal plate. So the very existence of the photoelectric effect is not in contradiction with the classical theory. And by classical theory, I mean the treatment of radiation as wave. But of course, um, we saw many property, properties of uh, about the, 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 the current that is, ge is generated by these electrons that are emitted. And in particular, we have seen that um, for different intensities uh, of radiation that you, that you throw towards the metal plate, you have uh, uh, different stop potentials for, for, you have, sorry, you have the same stop potential for different intensities. And this contradicts the classical theory, for instance. And also that the stop potential depends on the frequency of the uh, radiation that you send in. And th this is not compatible with what you expect from the classical theory. So uh, what I said is uh, the photoelectric effect, the very existence of it is not a problem for the classical theory, but the details of how it occurs is. So, so the details, uh, they are not in agreement what, with what you would describe with the classical uh, wave theory of light. And then um, we have discussed the experiments by Rutherford um, and the discovery of the atomic nucleus. Okay, so this was a bit unrelated to what we were discussing uh, before, but um, um, also uh, uh, tied to that, we have described uh, how atoms um, have a specific uh, emission spectrum and how, um, um, you know, when you throw uh, white light uh, directed to a prism and you look at the spectral decomposition of, of this white light, how uh, you could see some dark lines or Fraunhofer lines in the spectrum and how it was related to the fact that atoms will emit or absorb very specific uh, values of wavelengths or frequencies or in other words colors uh, and we have discussed that this works as um, um, a fingerprint of the material so you can figure out what is the uh, uh, the material that uh, you have, for instance, inside a uh, 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 glass-made tube that you fill with some gas and you throw, uh, you throw light uh, through this, uh, this tube. And after light passed through the tube, you can decompose the, the line, uh, the, the, the light in the spectral lines, and you see which colors will be missing, and then you can identify which were the elements inside of the tube. So this was very important for characterization of uh, materials and atomic species that compose some, some, um, some material. Um, but of course, as we also discussed, uh, the very existence of the nucleus and the new atomic model proposed by Rutherford, where you had um, a tiny nucleus uh, 
um, in the center of your atom and negative uh, charges composed by electrons flying around this nucleus. How this uh, also was in trouble with the classical theory because according to the classical theory, uh, accelerated charges would emit radiation and therefore those electrons that were flying around the nucleus would emit radiation and they will start uh, falling into the nucleus and uh, therefore atoms would not be stable. And um, the proposal that, um, let's say, solved this problem in a certain sense uh, was made by uh, Niels Bohr and Niels Bohr postulated that the electrons will move around uh, the nucleus uh, with some uh, discrete value for the angular momentum. So we have seen that angular momentum is a quantity that will describe the motion of the electrons and it comes as a multiple of a constant which is uh, h bar. So it's the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Uh, let me make just a short remark here that very often we use h bar instead of h and at some point in this lecture I uh, will call Planck constant as being h bar and not h anymore but for now I will make this distinction and I'll call Planck's constant as being just h okay um, and uh, so the, the, the proposal by Bohr was, uh, was very uh, appealing in the sense that it could explain um, um, why the atom, why the hydrogen atom was stable. But, uh, and also it could explain the empirical equations that we had to describe the spectrum of a hydrogen atom. But uh, it had a very serious limitation, which was, well, first, Bohr had to postulate that angular momentum is quantized. And although we were already um, um, used to the fact that some quantities might be just a discrete set of values, as we saw with energy when describing the photoelectric effect and the black body radiation, uh, this is uh, something that you would like to describe from a more fundamental principle and not just take it for granted. But also, most importantly, uh, Bohr's theory was very specific to the hydrogen atoms. So if you wanted to describe more complicated atoms, namely with more electrons and so on, then it was not clear how to generalize uh, uh, Bohr's proposal. So this was a signal that uh, we were missing a consistent framework that would uh, tell you um, how to, well, give a system, how do you describe this system following, you know, a uh, recipe of, of well-established steps, as you do in classical mechanics, right? I give you a system, so I tell you how is the system, what is made of, so a set of particles, and how they interact, so I give you, well, they interact via electric force, gravitational force, or elastic force or whatever and if you have this information then you can choose a reference frame an inertia reference frame where Newton's law is valid and you can follow the rules I mean you just apply the classical equations of motion and um, you just um, 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 you just have an equation now that you can discuss um, 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 and you can solve the equation and discuss how the position of each object that composes the, the, the system will change with respect to time. So there is a question in the chat. Uh, please, uh, who introduced the concept of energy level? Well, um, I, so I don't know exactly who introduced, I mean, for the first time, but um, um, if you think about that, uh, the, the atomic model by Bohr has already um, an implication on that because um, the electron can emit 
uh, uh, radiation with a certain specific value of energy. So you can give, you know, some specific uh, amount of energy in order to make the electron to change its uh, 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 radius with respect to the nucleus. So you have different levels that it can occupy. But um, yeah, that's, uh, maybe I will search and, and tell you later, okay? Um, yeah, and uh, we close the week by a very speculative um, proposal made by De Broglie, um, uh, or should I say De Broglie, I don't know, but anyways, so I would just say De Broglie, and De Broglie essentially um, um, proposed that um, this uh, property that light seems to behave as a wave sometimes, and as a particle, uh, sometimes is should not be a particular property of light, um, and, but rather a general property of matter. So, if you have an electron, you should not expect um, um, you should not expect that um, the electron just behaves as a, a particle as we are used to, but also that the electron has a wave behavior uh, in some specific situations as as light. And you can therefore associate um, a wavelength to the electron, and we discussed how to do that last week. Um, but of course, I mean, making this formal proposal is not so difficult, but um, we should check experimentally if this is realized or not, right? Because you can say, well, I can compute a number that I call wavelength of the electron, but wave, first of all, wave, wave of what? And second, second of all, um, 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 you have to think, uh, if there is an experiment that reveals that uh, the electrons can indeed have a wave behavior. So let me check. Um, uh, there is something in the chat. Uh, since there is a lambda, such lambda equals to lambda naught. Why do you conclude that lambda um, prince? Can you specify what are you talking about? Okay, so you're talking about the Compton shift and in my notes, let me open my notes because uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, so can you tell me which page and uh, which slide? Or I don't know. Uh, can you tell me where the... Um, okay. Um, in your notes, um, anytime, you, um, anytime you have, uh, you are defining your lambda, like the wavelength lambda, not um, after the, um, the, 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 the scattering. You always say that the lambda is greater than the lambda, um, the initial um, wavelength. But um, in your discussion, you made it clear that we can choose our theta such so that our, um, the lambda will be called the lambda naught. So if um, there's a theta in which we can um, establish that relation, then we, you should always write, I think you should always write lambda is greater than or equal to um, lambda naught. So, uh, page 14, I said lambda is greater than lambda naught. And you are saying that I should write lambda is greater or equal than lambda naught. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yes, please. Because 
since there is a tutor said that um, lambda is equal to lambda no then there should be an um, the um, equal to also inside it should yeah, be greater but, than or equal to yeah yeah but you see uh, what is written in the notes uh, is uh, he found a component with the very same wavelength lambda naught of the incident and other components with wave, wavelength lambda such that lambda is greater than lambda naught so I don't think it contradicts what you're saying. I said there is one direction where lambda is equal to lambda naught and directions where lambda is greater than lambda naught. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it it has the greater than or equal to inside. It can be equal to, it can be greater than. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, okay. And, um, so what, uh, this, is this is where we stopped last week. And um, I also gave a short, um, um, well, let me call it proof, but I know that you, are, uh, that you have a, a very good mathematical background. So let me not, uh, let me be careful when I say proof because you know, you know real mathematics. So I'm not referring as a proof as a mathematician, but a proof as a physicist, that um, if you assume that the Broglie is uh, a hypothesis is correct, then you could derive uh, from the fact that um, the electrons around a nucleus, um, they should complete uh, an integer number of wavelengths. You could derive the quantization rule that was postulated by Bohr. And if you think about that, um, you can say, well, you're also postulating that matter behaves as a wave. Um, but of course, if you detect that this is the case indeed, then uh, you're not postulating that anymore. You're just seeing that. While um, Bohr's proposal is really a postulate. You're saying, well, uh, this quantity must be um, 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 quantized uh, because um, um, I don't see the atom disintegrating. But of course, there are several different ways of, of quantizing things. So the specific proposal by Bohr is, uh, is by hand. Um, and if you can derive that from a more fundamental principle, and the fundamental principle would be that um, there is, uh, you know, this symmetry that between particles and waves, and particles can behave as waves, and waves can behave as particles, then you can explain this quantization rule. But what I want to do today is to start properly um, what is the, the, well, the modern formulation of quantum theory. By modern, I don't mean uh, that was uh, invented like a couple of a couple of years ago. It's an almost hundred years old, um, and still, it is extremely effective. It describes uh, essentially all of the. Um, experiments uh, we know um, but I have before going to that I want to do a piece of motivation and this will be divided in two parts one is just a speech I will just tell you about something and the second is um, um, I want to elaborate a bit more on this wave particle duality okay um, Okay, so let me start by saying that what we have did so far, we have what we have done so far was um, to understand that um, some experiments could not be explained by um, classical theory, and we started with uh, light. Okay, so light uh, was the our very first object that um, 
um, told us that, well, the classical description cannot be complete or correct uh, in full glory. Uh, but we have to introduce some new concepts that are completely um, um, against, let's say, what the classical theory says. And those elements, they were introduced in a very um, um, random way as uh, when performing a new experiment and not being able to describe with classical physics, people then try to impose uh, a new assumption. And this started to build, let's say, uh, a way of describing uh, this, this phenomenon. Um, but, well, the power of physics is that you can summarize a huge set of different um, um, phenomena in simple rules, right? So, well, simple, by simple, I don't mean really simple in the, in the sense of being super easy, but I mean, if I give you a set of rules and I can explain a lot with that, then uh, this is typically what we call a good physical theory, right? And this was essentially what classical physics was about, right? I mean, we could describe a lot about our um, daily lives phenomena, or even beyond that, for instance, the motion of planets and so on, by using uh, simple dynamical laws, um, that started to become more and more abstract, okay? So when we talk about Newton's theory, we are talking about the motion of a ball, you know, that we are used to. So something that you see, something that you have an intuition about. And that's what is uh, uh, very nice about it. So there is something that you, well, you know if you kick a ball, you can, just by practicing, you can estimate uh, where the ball will land. Uh, but Newton's theory can tell you with very good precision where the ball will land. Uh, Newton's theory can also explain to you with very good accuracy the motion of uh, the planets in our solar system with some exceptions that you're probably going to see uh, in the general relativity course. But this is amazing. I mean, you have uh, um, a set of rules that you can describe the motion of a ball in your uh, uh, backyard and also the motion of planets. And, and things started to become more and more uh, abstract because, uh, for instance, if you look at Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, you start talking about fields, fields that you don't, you know, you don't see in the usual sense. So when we talk about the electric field and the magnetic field and that a particle, an, an accelerated particle will emit radiation and, um, and how this connects with, uh, uh, um, uh, with something that is intuitive and visible, this is starts to get more and more uh, abstract. But still, I mean, you do some experiments. So you learn how to compute the electric force according to Coulomb's law by, you know, trying uh, to find out what is the equation that describes the force, doing experiments. And then, I mean, mathematics come in you start making uh, vector calculus uh, manipulations and by cons mathematical consistency, you start to predict things that you would never see. And uh, then you have a much more abstract theory, which is the theory uh, of electromagnetism. But still, it's uh, a theory that describes a lot of, of phenomena in our uh, uh, daily life. So it is something that maybe it's not as 
concrete as Newton's theory, but it's something that you definitely see uh, uh, happening. Um, okay. Um, so, after, uh, after seeing all that, um, what is the problem that we are facing at the moment of our discussion? Uh, the problem is that we know that classical theory is not at work. So we know that it should be modified uh, to something else that incorporates all these things that we discussed last week. And this new theory must be, in order to be useful, uh, it must be systematic. I mean, I, I must know uh, a set of rules and follow them, and then I can make predictions. And those predictions must agree with what we measure in the lab. So, um, this is our task from now on, okay? We are going to start to develop a systematic theory that we are going to call uh, the modern quantum theory or modern quantum mechanics. Um, but, I mean, just because this is the useful theory that we have, I will stop, say, modern quantum theory and modern quantum mechanics and just call it as quantum theory or quantum mechanics, okay? And this is the goal, essentially, for the rest of these lectures. It's to develop a systematic um, set of rules that will allow us to make uh, predictions at the quantum level. And let me make two more remarks, and then we start, let's say, uh, a more physical dis discussion, which is, the first remark is that <clears throat> um, we started our discussion about the foundations of, 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 the, of quantum theory um, using light. Um, we are going to speak about light for some, some while, but um, in order to really understand the conceptual uh, um, wave particle duality and all those strange things for light, you need to take into account two facts. The first one is the quantum nature that we are going to discuss in this course. And the other one is that light moves at, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's silly to say that, but light moves with the speed of light. So this is a relativistic object, as you probably already know from the other course. So in order to describe light, uh, you have to take into account relativity and also quantum mechanics. And it turns out that a theory that brings together relativity and quantum theory requires much more background than you have up to now regarding uh, uh, quantum mechanics. So we first will describe relativistic, sorry, we first is we are first discussing non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So we are going to discuss systems where relativistic effects can be neglected. Um, when you discuss relativistic quantum mechanics, you have to go to what is called quantum field theory. And this is the elementary framework that describes the quantum nature of light. And this is not going to be covered in this course, but as far as I understood, you have an introduction to quantum field theory in your uh, training program. So you probably will learn about that in the future. Um, but let me tell you that the non-relativistic quantum theory, although it's much simpler, uh, it's, uh, it's already absolutely non-trivial, okay? And the second thing I want to say, and last thing before I move to the slides, is that um, 
Um, the formalism that we are going to discuss for the description of quantum systems, so the mathematical formalism and the way that we phrase physical laws is very different from uh, what you have seen so far. So in the beginning, many things will look absolutely weird and it's totally uh, expected that. So if you find the formalism very intuitive and so on, well, there is a famous quote that says that if you think you you if you think quantum mechanics e is easy, then you probably did not understood it. So, um, well, I don't want to say that, but um, if you want, until you get some some you know working intuition with quantum mechanics, it, it takes some time. So it is completely acceptable that in the beginning you find things weird. And you, you know, you have to just. Uh, well, there is this also this expression that is, uh, I also don't like to say much, but it's 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 a bit appropriate when you are starting to learn quantum mechanics, which is uh, shut up and calculate. Okay, so sometimes you just have to obey the quantum mechanics rules and calculate, and then you you are going to to learn at some point after gain, gaining some practice with um, 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 with the theory, how to understand those concepts that before were absolutely unclear to you and you just accepted, shut it up and did the calculation. So I don't want, uh, but that being said, I don't want you to shut up. I want you to ask as many questions as possible. But what I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that, um, um, at some point, uh, if you find that the calculations are extremely, uh, uh, well, not the calculations themselves, but the rules that you're following to do the calculations are extremely non-trivial, um, it's because they are. So you have to really, for some, some, some time, to trust the rules in order to develop an intuition, okay? But if you think this is not new to you, so when you were born, um, you probably uh, described in your mind the motion of bodies as 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 the old Greek uh, uh, philosophers did. So, for instance, you you see that if you push a body uh, on the floor, then the body will move, but it will stop. And then you can say, well, my intuition about the world says that if I want that a body keeps moving, then I have to keep, well, exerting a force on it. And then Newton came and said, well, if a body uh, is uh, uh, moving, it will keep moving unless an external force stops it. And well, this is totally against your intuition, but because your intuition does not, uh, your first, very first intuition as a child is not to understand that the floor is exerting a force on the body. Okay? So when you learn uh, Newtonian uh, theory, you have to develop a new intuition because now things will move forever. <laughs> unless uh, something stop it and uh, stop them so uh, this is more or less what is going to happen from now on but in a much more severe way okay okay so uh, let me uh, see the chat because I saw that something went on uh, okay so Prince uh, uh, why didn't Newton see the dark lines? They both used prism and light. So you're probably referring to Newton and Fraunhofer. Yeah. Okay. So the difference in the experiments was that Newton was using uh, white light from a source placed on Earth, and Fraunhofer was using uh, white light coming from the sun. 
and the sun has an atmosphere that is composed by some atomic species that will absorb some of the colors. So, um, Fraunhofer then uh, did not see those colors that were absorbed by the solar atmosphere, while Newton could see, uh, since he was using a, um, a source placed on Earth. Um, uh, so Prince said thanks, because Elise just, just make some comments. Mahmoud uh, typed a lot of H's. I don't know what this means. Uh, then there is a very nice question. Uh, photons, are photons matter? Uh, first, we have to define what matter is. OK. Um, but we are going to see that um, um, photons behave, photons correspond to the particle description of light. But since light behaves as particle and waves, you can say, well, photons, that are the, the particles of light, actually are the thing that behaves as particle and wave. So you're going to discuss that in a bit. That's a very nice question. Um, Um, Elise, uh, is there any relation between Bohr concept and wormhole creation? So, which Bohr concept are you referring to? And how is that supposed to be related with wormhole creation? Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Mahmoud uh, uh, said that photon can behave like a particle and wave. Particle and wave, that's correct. Uh, Prince continued on, on the question. Please, won't the source pass through any gas in the middle? Yes. Uh, so, uh, the, the point is that if the gas uh, is diluted enough, then you don't see, I mean, it's the, the absorption will be much less severe than in the case of the, the sun atmosphere. So, it's not, uh, 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 you don't see the effect uh, because essentially, um, some of the light rays will, will be absorbed, will have some colors absorbed, but also some of light rays will pass through these this atoms that compose this gas without any, any you know, obstacle. So they will, they will arrive at the source, uh, at, the, at the prism. Okay. And you see, uh, warm roll relates to time machine and... Uh, and what is that about? I mean, wh why is this related to to the to Bohr? But I think we can postpone this discussion for later um, because it starts going a bit uh, off of what you're discussing now. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is to uh, make more precise what I mean by a particle and a wave behavior. Because this is essential for what we are going to discuss in the modern quantum theory. So I want to, to discuss um, what I mean by a wave behavior and what I mean by a particle behavior and how uh, uh, um, this hypothesis made by De Broglie is experimentally justified. So after saying that electrons could behave as a wave, how can, can we detect that? And this is uh, explained in the celebrated and so-called double slit experiment. And we're going to discuss that today. And with that, we are going to introduce already many, many concepts that will be part of the general theory of quantum mechanics, okay? So this is uh, a very important experiment that I hope you, you understand. And from tomorrow on, we are going to discuss the mathematics behind this experiment. 
well, not this experiment, sorry, the mathematics that give you the general framework of quantum mechanics. Okay, so I think actually it's a good moment for our break because I don't want to um, start the slides and and um, and speak for six minutes and then stop for the break. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, we have 10 minutes uh, of break and then we come back for the discussion of the double slit experiment, okay? Uh, so I'll stop the recording and... Uh, uh, okay, see you.